Welcome to Shaname, Book of Kings. Today we begin a new chapter on the story of Darob and the Fuller. Balman, also called Ardashir, fell sick and died, and the throne became vacant. Homei, his daughter, who was pregnant by him, placed the crown on her head and began a new reign. She reviewed the army and distributed wealth from her treasury, and as she inaugurated her rule, she announced to the world her justice and generosity. Calling down the blessings on the crown and throne, she cursed anyone who wished her ill, promised that she would act benevolently and harm no one, that she would help the poor, and that the rich and powerful had nothing to fear from her. Her wisdom and justice surpassed her father's, and the world flourished beneath her righteous reign. When the time came for her to give birth, she rid herself away from the army and the townsfolk. She enjoyed the fact that the throne was hers, and that the world was in her hands. Her son was born in secret, and she told no one, keeping the boy hidden. Secretly, she entrusted the prince to a nobly born wet nurse, and told any one who had got wind of his birth that the boy had died. And so she kept the crown on her own head, victorious and happy in her occupancy of the throne. She sent her armies against powerful enemies, wherefore ever they sprang up, and nothing good or bad that happened in the world remained hidden from her. Everywhere she pursued justice and righteousness and ruled well. The world became safe under her care, and the people of every country praised her. So eight months passed, but when the young prince began to resemble the dead king, Homei ordered a trustworthy carpenter to choose wood that would be delicately carved. She made him a small chest which was smeared outside with pitch, musk, and wax, and lined it with soft brocade from Greece. A little mattress sewn with precious pearls was placed inside, and rolled red gold together with rubies and emeralds were lavishly scattered there. A jeweled clasp was fastened to the still, unweaned prince's arm. Then, while the unsuspecting baby slept, her nurse embraced him and profusely wept. She laid the boy in whom she'd fed her milk within the chest, beneath a shawl of silk. The lid was fastened down with pitch and musk. Now silently, as night succeeded dusk, they took the casket to the riverside and launched it on the quickly flowing tide. Two men, detailed to watch it through the night, were forced to run to keep the chest in sight. It bobbed along as if it were a boat. The broad Euphrates kept the craft afloat and bore it downstream on its watery way until the sunrise brought another day. At dawn, the chest bumped against the river bank. It had reached a place where the river had been deliberately narrowed, and stones had been placed in a channel. Fuller's worked there, washing and bleaching clothes. One of them caught sight of the little craft and ran over to free it from where it had been stuck. When he opened the chest and drew aside the rich cloths within, he was astonished at what he saw. He wrapped the chest in the clothes he'd been washing and ran home with full hopes that this would mean a change in their fortunes. Meanwhile, the men detailed to watch what happened to the chest quickly went back to the palace and reported to Homei all that had occurred. The queen told them that they must not reveal to anyone else what they had seen. When the man who had found the chest arrived at his home, unexpectedly his wife said, what brings you home at this time with the clothes all wet still? Who's going to pay you for work like that? It happened that the couple had had a fine baby boy who had recently died, and the fuller's heart was still grieving for his lost child. His wife, too, was still weeping and groaning and had scratched her face with her nails in her grief. The man said to her, Come on now, pull yourself together. All this crying and mourning isn't doing you any good. Now promise you'll keep a secret, my dear and I'll tell you something worth hearing. Next to the boulder, where I beat the clothes, when I threw the clean clothes into the water to rinse them, I saw a little chest stuck in the channel, and hidden inside it was a baby. When I opened the lid and saw the little mite inside, I could scarcely believe my eyes. Our own little one died after a short life, but now you found another son, and there's money with him, all manner of finery. Then he set the clothes down on the floor, unwrapped them and opened the chest. 
The wife stared in astonishment and called down God's blessings on the baby over and over again. She stared at the infant's shining face, which looked like artist shears, nestled in the silk, and at the pearls sewn into the mattress, the rubies and emeralds by his feet, the red gold piled on his left, and the royal jewels on the right. Quickly, overwhelmed with joy, she set the baby to her milk-filled breast. The little child and the wealth that was with him made her forget all her sorrows. Her husband said to her, we must always protect this child, even at the risk of our own lives. He must be the son of someone important. Perhaps he's one of the world's princes. The fuller's wife cared for the child as if he were her own. On the third day, they named the child, and because he had been plucked from the flowing water, they called him Derob. One day, the fuller's wife, who was a sensible woman, said to him, What are you going to do about the jewels? What do you think would be the wisest course? He answered, My dear, hidden jewels are no more use to me than dirt is. It's better that we leave this town and all our past poverty and difficulties behind. We should go to a town where people don't know whether we're rich or poor. The next morning, they packed up their household and quitted their house, and gave their country no further thought. They carried Darab in their arms and took with them the jewels and the gold and all that was with him. They traveled for about two hundred miles, and then they settled in a town where they were strangers. Here they lived as relatively well-to-do people, being careful to placate the local lord with gifts of jewels, and he sent them cloth and cash in return. The wife, who was always giving her husband advice, said to him, "'We don't need to work any more. You're a rich man, and you don't need worry about looking for a trade to follow.' But the fuller answered, "'My dear,' You're a sensible woman, and you give good advice, but what's better than what you call a trade? A trade is the best thing a man can have, and yours is to bring up Darab properly and well, until we see what fate has in store for him. They brought up the child with such care and tenderness that no harsh wind ever harmed him. In a few years he grew into a fine boy, strong and with a royal far visible in him, he challenged older boys in the street to wrestling matches, and none of them was his equal in strength. Then they'd rush at him in a group, but he would defeat them all. The fuller became exasperated with him. His own fortunes had declined, and he ordered the boy to beat clothes against the rocks with him, saying there was no shame in this. And when Darab ran away from the work, the man wept tears of rage and grief. He had to spend a good part of each day looking for the boy, either in the town or out on the plain. Once he found him with a bow in his hand and a thumb stall to protect his thumb as he loosed the arrows. He took the bow from him and coldly said, You're acting like a vicious, uncontrollable wolf. What business can you have with a bow and arrow? Why have you become such a troublesome young man? And Darab answered, Father, why must you muddy the stream of everything I do? Send me to someone learned, one who teaches the customs that the Zend Avesta preaches. Then you can put me to a trade, but don't think I'll be settled yet, because I won't. The fuller remonstrated with him for a long time, but finally sent him to a group of teachers, where he learned to be a cultivated young man, and stopped being so abusive and stubborn. Nevertheless, he told his father, I'm not cut out to wash clothes. Stop worrying about me. The one thing I want in the world is to be a horseman. His father found a fine horseman, a man with a good reputation, as a horse-tamer, who was also skillful with the bridle. He sent his son to him, and there Darab learned all that pertained to horsemanship, the use of the bridle, lance, and shield, how to control a horse in battle, how to play polo, how to shoot with a bow from the saddle, how to seek honor, and how to evade the enemy's reach. One day Darab said to his father, "'There's something I've kept hidden.' I don't feel an instinctive love for you, and your face doesn't resemble mine at all. It's always surprised me when you call me son, and when you make me sit with you at your work. The fuller answered, These words of yours bring back old sorrows. If you feel your nature is above mine, then go and find your father. Your mother knows the secret of all that business. And when the fuller left one day for the river, Darab locked the house door, 
and came before his mother with a sword in his hand. He said to her, Don't try any tricks or lies. Give me an honest answer to everything I'm going to ask you. How am I related to you? Whose family do I belong to? And why am I living here with someone who washes clothes? The man's wife was terrified and begged Darab not to harm her. Invoking God to protect her, she said, Don't spill my blood. I'll tell you everything you've asked. And then she described without provocation all that had occurred telling him about the chest containing the unweaned baby and about the coins and the royal jewels. She went on, We were folk who worked with our hands, and we weren't from a wealthy family. All we have in the way of fine clothes and wealth is from you. We served you and brought you up, but it's for you to give the orders. We are your body and soul, and you must decide what's to be done. Darab was amazed when he heard all this, and he brooded for a while before saying anything. Then he asked, Is there any of the wealth left, or has your husband spent it all? We live wretchedly enough these days, but is there enough left for me to buy a horse? The woman answered, There's more than enough for that. And besides, we've bought profitable orchards, woodlands, and pastures. She gave him some money and showed him the jeweled clasp. Darab used the money to buy a fine horse, a cheap saddle, and a lariat. There was a great lord of the marches living in the neighborhood, a dignified and wise man able to give good guidance. His soul troubled by dark thoughts, Darab presented himself before this man, who took him into his service, and saw that he came to no harm. It so happened that an army from the west attacked and began plundering the area. The lord was killed in battle, and the troops were left leaderless. When Homei heard this, she sent her general, Rishnavid, to drive the enemy back and to destroy the strongholds. Rishnavid gathered an army and inspected and provisioned it. Darab was overjoyed at the news of the expedition and hurried to register his name as a warrior. Troops poured in from all sides, and when they were amassed, Homei and her military chiefs came out of the palace to watch the troops pass by and be counted and to have their names checked. She caught sight of Darab and the far radiating from him. With his great strength and the massive mace on his shoulders, it seemed as though only he were on the plain, and that the ground was there merely to bear his war-horse. And as she stared at his chest and his handsome face, her maternal breast flowed with milk. She said to one of her entourage, "'Where is that knight from? The one who seems to be such a strong, splendid young man, he looks like a nobleman, like a knight who's experienced in warfare, brave, proud, and dignified, but his weapons, his weapons aren't worthy of him. The army met with her approval, and she selected an auspicious day for them to begin the campaign. The leaders agreed on their strategy and led the army away. Homey set her agents with them so that nothing that transpired would be hidden from her, and she would know everything that went on in the army, whether of good or evil and her worries would be laid to rest. The army set out filling the plain, marching by stages beneath the moon. One day, a violent wind began to blow. Thunder crashed, and the sky was filled with rain and lightning. The land was awash with water, and the army fled in all directions, trying to get out of the rain and looking for places to pitch their tents. The commander, Rishnavid, was worried by this turn of events. Darab, too, was bewildered by what was happening and tried to escape from the heavy rain. He saw a mass of ruins with an archway that was still standing. High, ancient, and crumbling, it looked as if it had once been part of a royal edifice. Darab had no palace hall or women's quarters at his disposal, not even a tent or a companion or a pack animal. He was alone and friendless, and he had no choice but to sleep beneath the crumbling archway. When Rishnavid was trying to round up his scattered troops, he happened to pass by the archway, and he heard a roaring sound coming from the ruins that seemed to say, O oh, ruined arch, be on your guard and keep the Persian king you shelter safe and sleep. He had no tender friend, and so he lies beneath you, sheltering from the stormy skies. Rishnavid said to himself, Is that the noise of thunder, or is it the howling wind? And then he heard the roar again. O oh, Arch, keep wisdom's eyes awake. Take care. King Ardashir's young son lies sleeping there. 
and the roar sounded for a third time, at which she turned in astonishment to an adviser and said, "'What can this mean? Someone should go and investigate who was sleeping under that arch.' A group went and saw a young man lying there. He looked both wise and warrior-like, but his clothes and horse were soaking wet and filthy, and his bed was the black earth. When Rishnavad was told what they had seen, the commander's heart beat faster, and he said, "'Call him quickly. Who could endure to hear such a roar as we heard?' Then they went back and called out, "'Hey, you! Lying asleep on the ground! Wake up and get on your feet!' As Darab mounted his horse, the arch collapsed. Rishnavad fixed his eyes on Darab, scanning him from head to toe, and said, "'This is a marvel among marvels. Nothing more wonderful could be imagined.' Then he hurried the young man to his pavilion, praising God as they went. He ordered clothes to be brought and a place to be set aside for Darab. They lit a large fire on which they burned sandalwood, musk, and ambergris. When the sun rose above the mountain top, Rishnavid took a complete set of clothes, a saddled horse with a golden bridle, a bow and a sword and a golden sheath to Darab. As he presented them, he said to the young man, "'You're lion-hearted, a fine young man, eager for fame, but who are you? What is your lineage, and what country are you from? It would be best for you to tell me the truth.' Darab told Rishnavad everything, just as the woman he had thought was his mother had explained it to him. He told him about the chest and the rubies, the jeweled clasp on his arm, and the gold coins, the brocade in which he had been wrapped, and his sleep in the casket where he had been concealed. At once, Rishnavad said to a messenger, "'Go like the wind and bring the fuller and his wife here. Bring me this Mars and Venus, both of them.' The army then marched to the frontier with Greece, and Darab was made leader of the advance guard. The tips of whose spears had been dipped in poison, they met with the vanguard of a Greek force patrolling the borderlands. Suddenly, the two armies were face to face, and the dust of the battle rose into the sky. They fought hand to hand, and blood flowed like a river. Quick as wind-blown dust, Darab urged his horse into the melee, and killed so many of the enemy soldiers that it seemed as if heaven itself wielded his sword. It was as if a lion attacked, a lion grasping a monster as a weapon, and with a dragon for his mount, the lion pressed on to the Greek camp, guided by his sword's search for victims, till the earth was awash with a sea of Greek blood." Having routed the enemy forces, Darab returned to triumph to his commander, Rishnavid, showered him with praise, and said, May the royal army never lack your presence. When we get back to civilization from this Greek expedition, you'll be richly rewarded by the queen. She'll give you horses, silvering swords, and diadems. All night the army prepared its armor and horses for the coming day, and when the sun rose, illuminating the land like a lamp, the two armies met again, and the dust of their encounter darkened the sun. Darab launched his attack, releasing the reins of his charger. He slew all the champions who rode forward from the Greek ranks, and like a wolf made for their army's heart, scattering the huge force before him. From there he turned against the right flank, plundering weapons and baggage as he went, and when their troops fleeing from him pell-mell, the Persian warriors followed in his wake like lions, killing so many of the Greek troops that the ground turned into a quagmire with their blood. Darab killed forty of their priests and returned to his own lines with a captured cross in his fist. When Rishnavad saw the wonders Darab performed, his heart bounded with joy again. He showered Darab with praise, adding words of affection as well. Then night came on, the world turned black as pitch, and everyone turned back from the battlefield. Rishnavad made his headquarters in the captured Greek camp. There he rested and loosened his sword belt. When it came to the distribution of plunder, he first sent someone to Darab, telling him to take what he would like, and distribute the rest as he saw fit. As he was a finer warrior than even the great Rostam, Darab chose a fine lance, and passed everything else back to Rishnavad, wishing him victory and joy in the days to come. After sunset, as darkness spread, it was as if a cloth of black brocade had covered the army. 
The commander made the rounds of the camp guards, and their shouts re-echoed in the darkness like the rumbling of an earthquake or the roar of a wild lion. When the sun lifted its golden shield again, the sleeping warrior woke, donned their armor once more, and set off in pursuit of Greek forces. They torched the towns they came on, and the name of Greece was obliterated from the land. Lamenting was heard throughout Greece for the loss of territory. Its king felt himself hemmed in by the world's fury, and his noblemen turned pale with shame and fear. His messengers arrived before Rishnavad and said, May your queen be just to us. We who desired war are exhausted by it. And Greece's fortunes had declined. If you desire us to pay taxes, we will pay them. Let us renew the peace treaty between us. The Greek king also sent gifts of many kinds, in addition to numerous slaves bearing purses of cash. Rishnavid accepted whatever was sent, which included gold coins and uncut jewels. And here's where I end my tale for today. But I'll be back tomorrow with more tales, many more tales. Until then, my friends. <laughs>